it's it's not uncommon that we are working with people that are recovering from medical leave as a result of a really severe burnout because they have not understood how to manage themselves as a more sensitive person. Hey friends, and welcome to the Next Best Thing podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Klein-Thomas. Now I'm here to help you live the life that you design instead of choosing a life you think you have to settle for. Today, we're gonna start with a question. Has anyone ever said, you're too sensitive? Or they may say, man, you just take everything so personally. And as a result of the criticism, right? Because it is criticism when people say it that way that you have tried to kind of mask it or, you know, shape shift in a space because it's not okay to be that vulnerable or show up or show that side of yourself, right? But still you're internalizing that feedback from your boss. You might actually be ruminating on it. Or are you a person who may like absorb energy in a room? Folks don't even have to say a word, you know, like I, this person's a good person. This person is not. Okay. Um, how about maybe you're a person who like the job is really a nine to five, but not for you because you go above and beyond. You go from morning until the job is done and it's going to be done amazingly. It doesn't matter what it costs you. You are going to put out a masterpiece into the world. Um, or how about you will do anything. And I mean, anything not to disappoint someone else. Let me just go ahead and say ouch before you do. I, I can't be the only one. You should be saying ouch too. You should. Wherever you are listening or watching, you probably should be saying ouch too. Chances are you're a very high achiever um, and you might be sensitive. And there is a term for it that we're going to be talking about today. It's not just like, oh, this is how, you know, you just need to be less sensitive. No, it's an actual thing. Like there's actual research behind how you process information. It's not just a, oh, you just are a sensitive person because you choose to be that way. It might just be because of how you process information. Melody Wilding is here to break it all down for us and really explain this. She is a human behavior professor, executive coach, and author of a book perfectly titled, Trust Yourself, Stop Overthinking and Channel Your Emotions for Success at Work. Her new book, Managing Up, How to Get What You Need from the People in Charge, that's the title now, that book comes out next year. Here is the thing. Please, I am saying this with all the love in the world, right? And I've had to learn this the hard way. Sometimes what is delaying our next is not external. Now, look, sometimes external situations are trash and you need to go ahead and get gone. Um, but sometimes it's not external. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes we are the obstacle because of a lack of strategy, um, we are the obstacle because we can't manage our emotions. Sometimes it's us. I, I know, I know it's hard to hear, but stay with me here. Stay with me. There is no judgment in this conversation. The good news is that with tools, that thing that other people might see as a liability, that could be the very trait that could turn into your superpower with tools and strategy. And that can take you to the next level. That's what this conversation is all about. This conversation is about how to manage these work environments without costing you your soul. So you could actually have a really good time and you can leave work at work and then go have the rest of your life. All right. So get into this conversation with Melody and she shows us how. She has so many gems in this episode. She's breaking it all down. All right. Here's Melody. Melody, hello. It's great to see you again. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the Next Best Thing podcast. So happy to have you here. I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. You know, before we dive in, I really want folks to get a sense of what is really possible when you conquer your emotions. Tell us about some of the wins. Tell us about some of your clients and how they have won after working with you. 
I like to categorize these into internal wins and external wins because how we feel and how we are showing up for ourselves and how we trust ourselves then is reflective in the results we get. And so when you feel like you are more in control of your emotions, that doesn't mean you are suppressing them. It means you're able to identify them, you're able to channel them and navigate them. So there's so much more intentionality. You don't feel pushed around and not the whims of everything happening around you, the changes, the annoying email your boss or a colleague sends you, that doesn't send you through a roof or trigger you into this stress spiral like it used to. And when, when you're able to do that, I mean, very practically, you can be so much more productive and focused, but you feel better because you feel like you have agency over your work experience. And that's so important in a time where we spend 70% or more of our lives at work makes us makes up such a big part of who we are. We want to feel like we're in charge of that experience rather than feeling like a victim or powerless to it. And just to add to that quickly is then when you are able to do that, when you are able to stay more calm, composed, objective under pressure, well, that leads to bigger opportunities. People mm -hmm. tap you on the shoulder for bigger projects. I've had clients get six figure bonuses because they're able to get themselves out of the weeds and out of reactive mode. And that value is then reflected and they get that recognition from their higher ups and it, it becomes a virtuous cycle. Yeah. And you know, I think it's really important because sometimes we always think that, or sometimes we often think that it's okay. If the external environment was X, Y, and C to this purpose. And sometimes you do need to find a new environment to be in, but sometimes it's just us. Like we can make some adjustments. It's a hard thing to say and a hard thing to like internalize, but sometimes we are the ones who need to make some adjustments to be successful in that place. Even if you want to leave to say, I would tell myself like, well, I got my contract is has another whole year. Am I going to be miserable for another year unless everybody else changes? Like that's just not feasible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, that points to something very important that we have so much more control than we think. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with you. There are so many cases of people being stuck in toxic workplace situations, and that is very real. At the same time, systems, unfortunately, take a long time to change. And thank goodness we're starting to see a little bit of positive movement in that direction but you are able to change your own behavior, your own mindset so much faster than the situation can change around you. And what I find for my clients again and again and again is that you teach people how to treat you. And if you are always being a pushover, you are the one accommodating 10,000 changes to a meeting or the one who is always volunteering because no one else is raising their hand or you are the one that as soon as someone disagrees, you back down and say, okay, sure, we'll go with your idea. You're not teaching people to respect your ideas, your time, your bandwidth. And that is within your control. You can change that. That doesn't automatically mean you have to become a jerk or become okay. overly aggressive. You have to straddle that line of being able to stand your ground, to, to trust yourself and be competent. And that will change how other people respond to and react to you. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Now you, meeting you through the Tone Networks, that introduced me to the idea of uh, being a highly sensitive person or a sensitive striver. Um, and we throw around the term sensitivity, right? Um, but in terms of being a highly sensitive person, that's a clinical term. So explain what that means and how do you know if it applies to you? Yes. Being a highly sensitive person means plain and simple that you are someone that has a more responsive nervous system. And it is a term that comes from research. It's related to uh, something that's called sensory processing sensitivity in the research. And uh, this comes from the work of Dr. Elaine Aaron, who has been studying this for going on 40 years. And what her and her colleagues have found is that 
just like any personality trait or disposition, sensitivity to the environment, to our own thoughts, to other people's emotions and behavior exists on a spectrum. And some people are higher on that spectrum than others, which makes sense. What's really interesting, though, is that the research has found that people who rate higher on scales of sensitivity also have differences in how they process information. So how the brain processes things like dopamine and serotonin, how uh, different areas of the brain, for example, mirror neurons, which help us understand other people's emotions and behavior. People who rate higher on scales of sensitivity have more active mirror neurons. And so that's why people who are highly sensitive will all often say, I can read a room, I sense other people's emotions and behavior is because your brain is literally lighting up more when it comes to those things. Okay. That, that, that is like, for yeah. like, we'll pause right there because <laughs> yeah. I just like, yeah. I feel that, like, I feel that a hundred percent where I can walk in a room and I can, I can assess immediately and my brain's like, boop, 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 like immediately. Mm -hmm. So keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it, that's, that, that is a great sign. You may be someone who's highly sensitive. And I think the problem is that most of us feel like that is a defect mm -hmm. because it, it can, it can feel like a burden sometimes. And I'm sure we can, we can talk about that, but this has a very important purpose where back in, you know, prehistoric times, it was helpful to have a certain amount of people who were aware of what was going on in the surroundings, who were more attuned to potential risks, like uh, you know, someone in the group not having everyone's best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. That was dangerous to everyone. So having someone who was in sync with those things was really helpful. Unfortunately, now, when, our, when we're not aware of the fact that we have these traits, we don't know how to channel them or make them work for us, then that's where they can get in our way because we may be hyper vigilant. We may be overly risk averse or people pleasers because we don't want to get into conflict with other people. I hope you're picking up what Melody is putting down, right? <laughs> We're going to pause the conversation really quickly here just so I can ask, have you subscribed to the podcast yet? What are you waiting for? If you're enjoying this content, please hit the subscribe button right now. Bonus points if you turn on notifications, not only will it ensure that you never miss another episode, it will help the algorithm get this content in front of more people. That's always the goal. And guess what? Because Melody is dropping so many gems, you don't even have to take notes because I go ahead and do that for you with the Next Nuggets newsletter delivered to your email inbox every single Wednesday. All you have to do is go to the show description, click the link to sign up. Thank you so much for all of your support. It really, really means a lot. We're going to go back to the conversation. Yeah. Gosh. And you know, when they talk about sensitivity, they oftentimes use that trait for women, but it's agnostic. It's for anybody kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, th that's absolutely correct. And the research on this is still ongoing, but as of now, what they have found is that being highly sensitive, having a more responsive nervous system, it's about equal between genders because mm -hmm. it's, it's a genetic disposition. And so just like anything else you would see, it's pretty equally distributed. Um, at the same time, socialization comes into play. Mm -hmm. So women, we are socialized to put other people's needs ahead of our own. We're told don't rock the boat. Uh, don't be too much of a tall poppy because other people go aren't going to like you. Mm -hmm. Men are, or young boys rather, are often told, you know, don't be, don't be so emotional, toughen up. You need to have a thick skin. And, and so they start to deny their sensitivity. And so we get it from, from both sides. Yeah. And I've met many a sensitive man out there. <laughs> it's very ma macho presenting, but when you start getting, you know, below the layers, they're very, very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Um, how, and also highly sensitive people that's on the, it's, part of the neurodiver I don't know how to say this like it's part of neurodivergence there's different beliefs on this okay. and uh, again this is certainly something that's evolving mm -hmm. um, my definition of neurodiversity is that just like again just like we have 
racial, ethnic, cultural diversity, we also have neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. Our brains are different. We process information differently. And again, this is an area that is evolving. Some people do consider high sensitivity part of neurodiversity. Other people do not for one reason or another. So my, my personal view is that neurodiversity encompasses all mental and processing the full spectrum of that. Um, that's my personal opinion on that. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're highly sensitive and you recognize that about yourself, like what are the best environments for you and kind of what are some of the best practices? Um, yeah. What are some of the, just the best practices that allow you to navigate the workplace um, in a way that's not so heavy for you? Yes. And I think that's the key word is that it feels, it feels like a burden and it takes mm -hmm. a lot out of us. And so it's, it's not uncommon that we are working with people that are recovering from medical leave as a result of a really severe burnout because they have not understood how to manage themselves as a more sensitive person. Mm. The first thing to be aware of is that you likely need more processing time. And that doesn't mean you're slow necessarily, but it means that you may have to do things like asking for agendas in advance, or when you're put on a spot in a meeting, being able to say, that's a really great question. What I would love to do is give that some more thought so I could give you the best answer possible. And I'll get back to you by Friday with my answer. So just having some of those mechanisms where you know how you work best and being able to, again, teach people how to treat you through the way you communicate with them, the types of boundaries you set, the requests you make, that can go a long way. So understanding that you're a deeper processor mm -hmm. uh, can, go, can go very far. We, we're also talking about boundaries. Mm -hmm. And for sensitive people, because we are deeper mental processors, we can overthink everything, <laughs> everything. And since the pandemic happened, a way I've seen that really come up a lot is not being able to disconnect from work because mm -hmm. our minds are always turning over a project, a conversation we had, an email we need to get back to. And it's hard to just turn that off. And so you may find yourself waking up in the middle of the night or you, you literally can't down-regulate at night to be able to, to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And if you are someone who is, who is now working from home, all of our work schedules and our work life has been shaken up. Right. Completely upended. Yeah. It, it's really up to you to find ways to put in that boundary at the end of the day so you can start to create more of a distinction between this is work time, this is personal time. That doesn't have to be something elaborate, but it can be that at the end of the day, you take five minutes to write down three things that went well and three things you need to focus on the next day. It could be uh, lighting a candle or changing your clothes. Um, I know for me, when the television goes on, that's sort of my cue that work time is over and personal time is starting. So having those rituals for yourself as a sensitive person really helps ground us because mm -hmm. we, we don't do well with uncertainty or feeling rushed. <laughs> so the more time and space you can give yourself, the more of a runway you can give yourself to sort of decompress into the evening, the better off you will be. Yeah, you know, and it feels like being highly sensitive needs um, like a psychologically safe space to exist in, yeah. you know, and oftentimes workplaces are not psychologically safe. Um, how do you respond to that? Or do you just have to find the space that is psychologi psychologically safe? Yeah. You know, honestly, I think everyone deserves and, and functions better in a psychologically safe space. To your point, it's even more important when you're someone who is more who is more sensitive and attuned mm -hmm. to what's going on around you. Um, and so, yes, you know, no workplace is perfect. No boss is perfect. Only you know what you can accept. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important work for all of us to do about what are our own non-negotiables around how I want to be treated, around um, how, 
how safe it feels to speak up about my ideas or make mistakes. And even if, even if you can't change teams or change workplaces today, you might be able to be an example. So if someone speaks up and they've, they've made a huge mistake on a project, you could offer, you know, here's another way to look at this. We can also look at this as this was a really great learning experience, right? So again, you can be part of that change. And I also think if you are a sensitive person who is finding yourself in that situation, diversifying your sources of self-esteem. So many of us. That's yeah, so many of us get all of our identity and our self-worth from work. And if that's not going well, then you feel terrible about mm-hmm. yourself. And so having more to your identity than what you do, whether that's volunteering, it's investing in your family, what have you, but so that when work isn't going well or feels like a struggle, you have other areas of your life that you feel like you can fall back on and rely on. That's huge. I think that's really huge, but I feel like the culture is like work, center, work, center, work. Um, and I do. <laughs> I'm like, I have to say me too, me too, me too. Ouch. I'm, I'm feeling myself in a lot of these descriptions. Um, I always like joke with my friends and I say, you know, like I came into, I started in journalism and I, I was like, I came into this as a, a delicate flower. And then I got you know, bulldozed on the first day. And so I toughened up, you know, I had to toughen up very quickly and I had to develop the thick skin. And I think sometimes when people have to adapt to an environment, especially like being a black woman in the workplace, um, sometimes people might not identify themselves in this way because they've had to take on the mantle or take on the characteristics that for their own survival in these spaces. But for me, it's like, but I still am actually extremely sensitive because when I come home and I'm processing it, I'm like, I remember, especially at the beginning, like if I didn't like my performance, it was just like, oh, it would eat me up. It would really just eat me up all day. And then it's like uh, getting up in the morning, like I got to go do this again. Just I'm still processing it. I'm just not feeling safe enough to do it like Mm -hmm. in the workplace or show up in that way in the workplace or show that vulnerability in the workplace. But it doesn't mean that it's not happening, you know, some other time. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And that's such a great point. Again, being someone who is highly sensitive is intersectional. It's your gender, it's your race, it's other parts of your identity come into play. And as you were saying, it can feel like you have to wear a mask Mm -hmm. (laughs) because the way to show up in the way you want to be would not be acceptable Mm -hmm. or you would be ridiculed. And this is where I go back to, can you, to the extent that it feels safe to do so, Mm -hmm. but I have had clients in this situation have good success with being able to go to their boss and say, Hey boss, here's how the boss I'm, committed to achieving our goals together. Here's how you can get the best out of me. It would be really helpful if I could have X, Y, and Z ahead of our meetings, or if we could have one one one-on-one a week so that I would be able to ask you questions that would help us move the work forward faster. So you're asking for what you need, but you're also showing how is it a benefit to the other person? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're able to get more of what you need and want by doing that. But of course, long-term, you you do need to be somewhere where you feel like you don't have to wear that armor and that mask every day because that's additional emotional labor you're doing on top of everything else. Right. No, I think that's great. And just asking for what you need and and, because it does demonstrate a self-awareness. I was just in a meeting for a new um, client that I have and we had to, as an icebreaker, go around and say, what is your biggest work pet peeve? Because they were like, we really want to know. So we're mindful of that when Mm -hmm. we're interacting with each other. And so it it was just a really, I've never experienced that before, but I thought that was brilliant, like really, really brilliant. So it was like unapologetically this is how you work best. And it's like, great. I know this person likes to do this. I know this person prefers that. So it just, I, I appreciate that. And I want to go back to what you were saying uh, just about 
thinking of yourself, not just in the framework of work. What role should work be playing in our lives? <laughs> like, I think it's like a million dollar question, but like, really, like, it's really important. But at the same time, everybody is on a spectrum on this. So what's mm-hmm. health? What's healthy? Or I guess, when is it unhealthy? Yeah, I, I think that's a good a good place to start. Right, right. It becomes unhealthy when you feel codependent on your work. Mm-hmm. When you feel like you you literally cannot detach or step away from work without intense anxiety that you're missing out, that something is going to break, that people are failing without you. Um, going back to what I said earlier about if things at work are down, you feel absolutely devastated and you project that onto yourself as you're a terrible person, you're incompetent, you internalize it. That's when work is way too enmeshed with your identity and how you see yourself. You're not able to be objective and act calmly when things like that happen. Mm -hmm. To your question about what role work should play in our life, I like to encourage my clients to think of your career and your life in seasons Mm -hmm. because the role work should or needs to play is going to change depending on when you're first out of college versus when you're starting a family uh, versus when you do not have any kids or you are financially stable. So I have clients in all of those different situations. Right now, I have women who want to prioritize flexibility for one reason or another. And so some of them are choosing to take roles that may be slightly lower paying than what they had before, but are fully remote and allow them that flexibility. I have another client that has financially done extremely well in their career, and now they're applying for jobs completely outside of their realm of expertise because they're like, well, why not go for it now? Mm. And so thinking about what, what is this season of my life and my car- career? How do I want work to fit into that? And what am I optimizing for? Because you can optimize for too many things. <laughs> mm. You can try to optimize for uh, learning or income, flexibility, Um, the team that you work with, the opportunities that you have. It's going to be really, really difficult to find one role that meets all of those things. But if you're clear about these are the one to two priorities that I'm optimizing for in my work right now, it becomes much easier to say yes to certain opportunities and no to other ones. So again, optimizing for means like, I really want to make more money right now. So I'm kind of going to do what I need to do to make more money. And that's the season I'm I'm in. Or as you said, I really want flexibility right now. So I kind of, it's not like flexibility and money and all the things all at the same time. I think it's fair to have two or so in there. But if you're trying to get all of the things, it's not that it's impossible. It's just going to be a lot tougher and Mm -hmm. you might stress yourself out a lot more it really simplifies your decision-making to say, okay, right now I'm trying to optimize for learning in my role. I want as many opportunities to try different things, work with different people. What role meets that criteria the most? And if I can make more money doing it, great. But what role helps me optimize for my goal of learning and getting more experiences? Awesome. Awesome. Um, So we end the conversation um, with every guest with a segment called ACT UP, ACT, those are my initials. And it's all about how to get from where you are now to where you want to be. Somebody's listening to this and they're like, all right, I have heard a lot of my own personal characteristics in this conversation and I have a destination in mind. What's something that they can do today or a few things that they can do today or you know what? And let me back up a little bit because before we hit record, I was I was telling Melody that you know a lot of the guests that we have here end up choosing entrepreneurship because they can't navigate corporate, right? It's just not for them. But that's not realistic for a most people. Mm-hmm. Actually, I hope most people can have a job because entrepreneurship is just so hard in such a different way. Yeah. <laughs> 
So it's just like, how can you navigate the traditional work environment mm -hmm. and not um, have it cost so much to your spirit, to your soul, maybe to, to you financially? What are some of the things you questions you need to ask yourself or strategies that you can employ today to kind of get you on that path? Mm. So uh, you and I have talked about the fact that I'm writing this new book on managing yep. up. Yes. And one of the foundational exercises in there is writing what I call your me manual, mm. which is all about asking yourself those questions around how do I work best? How do I like to receive feedback? How do I learn? When I'm at my best, what does that look like? When I'm at my worst, what does it look like? How do I ideally like to process information? Even writing those down and getting clear about them. Most of us never stop yes. to think about that, but you can't assert what you don't identify and know about yourself. And so I would really encourage people to take time to even just sit with those questions, think about them, maybe create your own me manual doc. You don't necessarily have to share these with anyone yet, but it's also going to help you identify and pinpoint when you're frustrated with something and you're annoyed, why? Why? Mm -hmm. It's likely because it goes against some sort of value or preference that you have. And that can take a lot of the emotion out of it. Yeah. So again, a me doc to, can we just go over some of the questions that people should ask themselves again? Yeah. That's, that's really, really good. Yeah. Uh, I would say things like, how do I like to be managed? How do I like to receive feedback? How do I learn best when I am at my best in my work? These things are true. Mm -hmm. When I am at my worst at work, these things are happening. How do I like to process information or how do I prefer to process information? I think those are some, some things to get people started. That's so good. Yeah. So good. And I didn't start asking myself those questions until kind of I left. And there's just such a power in pausing and, and figuring out how you work best and not in the framework of how you think you should be. But really, like, what actually works best for you? Yes. Not having meetings before 11 o'clock works best for me and how I start my day. Because I my brain is on fire in the morning and I just need to get stuff out. So I prefer to have work time before I do anything before 11 o'clock. You know, like... Yeah all these different things that I didn't realize. I took a, a career assessment and um, after I took the career assessment, it was the first time I could look at my results and say, that's why that position didn't really work for me. That's why mm -hmm. that environment, because it had identified my values and centered my values in ways that I never applied to my work. And so it was amazing. You talked about your new book. Tell me more. You have so many things going on. Y'all, Melody is very, very busy. She's a very <laughs> busy person, okay? With LinkedIn Learn, and like just oh. so many things going on. Tell us how to support you. Uh, what we need to look out for all of the good things that is so kind thank you so much so my first book is called trust yourself and that is out now so if you resonated with everything about being a sensitive striver it is really your guidebook to making your sensitive sensitivity work for you instead of against you at work so you can find that wherever books are sold the best place to connect with me and find all of my resources as you were mentioning i have uh, probably by the time this comes out, I'll have 10 LinkedIn learning courses live. Um, the best place to find all of that and information about my new book is my website, MelodyWilding.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on there as well. Yes. Congratulations on everything, Melody. Thank so and thank you for being like a mirror to, because I think that it's just so important for people to be able to say, like, it's okay to see themselves and say, no, it's okay that I'm like this. Let me just find the place where I can kind of be myself. And so you help, you know, put a mirror in front of us and um, normalize how people different, like show up differently. And so I really, really appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to The Next Best Thing with Andrea Klein-Thomas, a Mountain Court Media production. The music was written, recorded, and produced by Gavin Casey. 
also known as dark purple. Now, if you like what you heard, please subscribe, give us a five-star rating, and write a comment on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to share it with friends. I hope this episode helps you on your journey. See you next time.